Good afternoon. I'd like to call the Comox Valley Regional District regular board meeting of Tuesday, May 11th to order. And we have a number of directors in the boardroom today. We have Director Hamir, Grieve, Arbor, and Hillian. And online, we have Director McCollum, Cole Hamilton, Morin, Swift, Grant, and Lee. So I'd first like to acknowledge that we're on the traditional unceded territory, the Comox First Nation, and to read the United Nations Declaration on the Rights of Indigenous Peoples, Article 32. Indigenous peoples have the right to determine and develop priorities and strategies for the development or use of their lands or territories and other resources. States shall consult and cooperate in good faith with Indigenous peoples concerned through their own representative institutions in order to obtain their free and informed consent prior to the approval of any project affecting their lands or territories and resources, particularly in connection with the development, utilization, or exploitation of mineral, water, or other resources. States shall provide effective mechanisms for just and fair redress for any such activities, and appropriate measures shall be taken to mitigate adverse environmental, economic, social, cultural, or spiritual impact. Um, I would like to also vary the agenda if the board pleases, um, just to allow for our delegations to switch in order. Um, so if move I move to vary. Thank you, Director okay. Morin and Hillian. Madam Chair, uh, may I also ask, because I'm working to a 430 deadline for the SRD, that the Black Creek Oyster Bay Services Committee report and recommendation be moved uh, just to the front so I can go back to my typing on the other stuff. It's- okay. uh, Would you like to have it come before the delegation, Director Lee? Yes, please. I'd like it to come forward as soon as possible because I have to get things into the SRD by 4.30. Okay, and- So it's F1. So, Director Morin and Killian, are you okay with that variation? Yes. Okay. Thank you. And anyone opposed to varying the agenda? Hearing and seeing none, that's carried. So, we will start with the Black Creek Oyster Bay Service Committee um, from May, May 10th. Thank you. I move recommendation one. Sorry, Is we're going to yeah, move receipt first. Oh, uh, move receipt. Second. And anyone opposed? That's carried. And yes, with recommendation. Move recommendation one. Second. Second. Uh, Director Lee and Greaves, thank you. And it is a vote of area C and D. Anyone opposed? Hearing and seeing none, that is carried. Thank you, Director Lee. Thank you so much, board, and I'm going back to my other work now. See you later. Thanks. Have a good evening. Thank you. Bye-bye. So we will go back to the uh, in-camera recommendation. And we will be moving in camera following the regular meeting mm -hmm. due to section 91C and 91K of the community charter. Anyone opposed? Hearing and seeing none, that is carried. Do adoption of minutes from April 27th. Yeah. That's the adoption of minutes for the regular meeting from April 27th. Director Grieve and Hillian, anyone opposed to adoption of those minutes? Hearing and seeing none, that's carried. And we'll move on to petitions and delegations. And we've reversed the order. So first we have Comox Valley Chamber of Commerce Economic Growth, Diane Hawkins, CAO. Director Hillian and Hamir, thank you. And we'll welcome Diane. Thank you so much. I haven't done this before, so, oh, yay, thank you. <laughs> <laughs> yep. Oh, that feels so much better. <laughs> <laughs> you can just let staff know when you want the slides to move forward. All right, thank you so much, Jesse. <laughs> So thank you so much. It's a privilege to be here today with all of you. I wish I could see all your lovely faces in person, but uh, this will definitely have to do. 
Um, the Chamber has an idea that we're excited about, and we would like to share that with you in the hopes of building collaboration and a stronger community together. Next slide, please. So we want to talk about the Chamber and the role that we have in our community. We want to talk to you about a Comox Valley Economic Collaborative, the proposed structure, a three-year plan, and next steps. Next slide, please. So as many of you know, the Chamber of Commerce has been a pillar of leadership in the business leadership in the Comox Valley since 1919. Somewhere between the end of World War I, prohibition and electricity arriving in the Comox Valley, the Chamber's founding members created an organization to represent the unified voices of our local business community. And a hundred years later plus, we're still proud to carry that important torch. And you don't get to be around for a hundred years without doing something right. In 1929, the board began pushing for an airport in the area, a ferry between Comox and Powell River, as well as one from Buckley Bay to Demon Island. In 1923, the chamber organized itself into six bureaus, good roads and transportation, civic, publicity, agriculture and horticulture, industrial trade and commerce, and legal. And by the mid-decade, it was well known that Courtney's future was on the river and the board formed a committee to work with the city. Even in 1939, the Board of Trade had established itself as a permanent and significant part of this community, regardless of the economic and political circumstances of the time. The longstanding mandate to help make the Valley a better place to live and work has continued. And as a community, we are still very much focused on keeping the Valley a great place to live, work and play. The Chamber has marked many important occasions with our community, from the opening of Lewis Park in 1932 to the 7.3 magnitude earthquake of 1946. And we've watched the first skiers descend Mount Washington in 1973, the discover of the Puntledge River, Alaska Masor in 88, from the opening of North Island College campus on the hill to the construction of a brand new hospital to every fantastic performance over 25 years of Vancouver Island Music Fest. The Chamber has been working diligently to foster growth, community spirit, and outstanding business practices that support a prosperous local economy. And the Chamber still advocates for business, promotes the business community and not-for-profit organizations. And we've even launched a Comox Valley Volunteer Connector this year to connect with not-for-profits with volunteers. We have 66 nonprofits as members and we're expanding that service to our community. The Chamber builds collaboration, connections and resources with other organizations to establish rapport and promote well-functioning networks within our community. Currently, we have formed a monthly collaboration with Tourism Vancouver Island, the Cumberland Business Association, yay Cumberland, they now have a business association, the Comox BIA and the Downtown Courtney BIA. And we've been working together to find solutions and provide resources to one another within our organizations. Next slide, please. So the Comox Valley Economic Collaborative. We see this as an invaluable resource to, our, to the Comox Valley because we believe that economic development is all of our responsibility, every single one of us that live in this community. We propose the creation of a Comox Valley Economic Collaborative, which would be coordinated by the Chamber, and the Collaborative would be an invaluable resource to our community. The Chamber believes that economic development is everyone's responsibility, and that includes residents, where we put our dollars, where we choose to put our dollars, small businesses, large box stores who hire locally, developers, contractors, not for profits, and the list is longer, I know. It's our responsibility as a community to work toward the Comox Valley's vibrancy and economic well being. And we've seen that more than ever with the pandemic and how we've all supported one another and got behind one another's programs. And at a time where there is some uncertainty as to next steps in terms of economic development, the Chamber proposes to develop an economic collaborative housed under the umbrella of the Chamber. This is a turning point in our community, an opportunity to do things differently. A new model can emerge that creates an inclusive focus of collaboration. It's a time now to build trust and work together as a community. Next slide, please. So part of the mandate for this is to promote the Comox Valley as a place to conduct business, to support a vibrant, healthy and profitable economy, 
and to create more collaboration in our community. I believe that we can find collaborative solutions to develop our community in a sustainable, responsible way and to invite, in, and to invite discussion. New slide, please. The chamber proposes the creation. Oh, hang on, I jumped aside, my apologies. I'm trying to follow along on my own notes. Thank you. So how we see this working is an invitation would be extended to community stakeholders with the goal that this collaborative will represent a broad and diverse group of stakeholders in our community. Representatives of the economic collaborative would serve a minimum of a one year term with an option to serve for a two year term. Each representative will be provided with a modest monthly honorarium. The economic collaborative will be responsible for creating an economic development strategy for the Comox Valley and we would meet monthly. This model is similar to the model that is used currently by the Comox Valley Community Health Network. It's an opportunity to, for invested voices at the table, not necessarily investment in terms of dollars, but also in terms of commitment and vision for the Valley. Next slide. And then based on, oh, these are the, rep so this is the representatives that we are proposing that we would um, make um, application to, to be part of the economic collaborative. Next slide, please. Uh, working groups. And then from that, that economic collective, we see uh, themes emerging where we may need to bring on other voices or other areas of expertise or experience that could look at emergency, emerging themes such as the pandemic economic recovery, the industry specific needs in our community, individual business concerns, domestic and foreign trade. We have we do have a lot of import export in the Comox Valley, emerging sectors and our labor force. Next slide, please. Decision-making model. The economic collaborative will operate on a consensus-based decision model. This, this allows for better decision-making, builds stronger community, creates uh, better engagement and protects minority needs and opinions. So everyone has a voice at the table because it's about our community. And the proposed structure, next, thank you. And then the next slide, please. I just have to take a breath, I am, um, I'm a little bit, a little bit nervous. <laughs> Sometimes when you say that, it helps. <laughs> You're doing okay. great. <sighs> okay. <laughs> Breathe. I always tell my students, breathe. <laughs> so here's, here's our model. The Comox Valley Chamber will provide an economic development coordinator to facilitate the roles and goals of the economic collaborative, such as the facilitation of monthly meetings, um, minutes, um, developing and overseeing implementation of an economic action plan and community engagement activities, liaison, liaising and developing relationships with economic state holders and community partners, leading strate strategic planning and project evalu evaluation sessions, and quarterly reporting to our stakeholders, community lead leaders, and funding agencies. The Chamber understands that an economic development officer has been hired at the regional district, and we look forward to having the opportunity to work with Lisa and develop a positive, work, positive working relationship as she launches her role in the Valley. And we believe with our experience as the Chamber of Commerce and the things that we've been doing, um, especially this past year around pivoting and, uh, and responding uh, on behalf of business during the pandemic, we believe that this is an opportunity for us to come alongside and support Lisa in any way we possibly can. So we, the project management would be happening by the Chamber of Commerce. The economic collaborative would be building between, and then we would look to the regional district, the Chamber's resources and other funders to make this happen. New slide, please. So we looked at a three-year plan, and next slide, please. This is how we would roll it out. So first of all, we want to establish and formalize the, the economic collective. So we need to bring in the players. 
establish a mandate in terms of reference, establish community engagement to ensure collaboration and build community trust, develop a new two-year economic action plan and vision, and determine methods to measure successful outcomes. Next slide. We would execute. So we would roll out the activities and initiatives as, as identified in the economic action plan that the collective determines, maintain community engagement and measure outcomes. And the third step to this is review. Establish the next two year economic action plan, maintain community engagement activities, continue to roll out activities and initiatives in the economic action plan, examine the results, develop a progress report outlining outcomes and next steps to stakeholders and community partners, recruit and replace re representatives of, leadership, of the leadership collaborative whose term is up. So give people an opportunity to take a break, or give room for someone else to be on that collective. And next slide, next steps. We would like to secure support from the regional district for project startup and ongoing collaboration, continue to research and apply for additional funding, um, have an economic development coordinator in place by August 1st, the economic development collaborative established by September 1st, an economic action plan in place by March, 2022. And the chamber respectfully acknowledges the financial and community pressure that the regional district board and its staff have been under during the pandemic, along with other unforeseen challenges this year. In our acknowledging this, we are taking into consideration a more shared approach to funding and building of the economic collaborative. The Chamber sees this as a terrific opportunity in our community to see collaborations and relationships develop that are focused toward a common goal. The success and vitality of the Comox Valley as a whole, the Chamber has a vested interest in maintaining partnerships, combining resources and sharing the load. And we've been doing that for a very long time. And together we all win. Economic development and recovery is everyone's responsibility. Thank you for your time. Great. Thanks so much, Diane. Thanks for letting us know what you do and what the possibilities are. Are you open to questions? Yes, of course. Okay, we'll start with Director Arbor. Thank you. I think I'm becoming known for just making comments and not asking that many questions. Uh, so I just have a comment and, and definitely I've noted um, what a great response the Chamber had um, to the COVID pandemic. I think it's uh, just about a year ago where you started your, your stay, stay Strong Comox Valley effort. And I think that was such a great rallying call at the time um, to all of our businesses and residents. So that was definitely noticed. And, and having attended some of the things you organize, it's, uh, you really do a good job. So um, great presentation today. And, and I mean, I'll be very brief. I'll just say, uh, count me in. On behalf of Area I really like that you uh, even uh, mentioned Hornby and Denman in there. And, and I think uh, this is the type of initiative that I think holds a lot of promise as we move through the recovery. Thank you. Thank you so much. Dr. Hamir. Thanks, Chair. And thanks for, to Diane for a great presentation. Um, it's always great to catch up on, on what the Chamber is doing. And I'm really interested in this model. Um, I have a couple of questions and one maybe for you know, for you, I know you alluded to it and as did um, Director Arbor around your activities during COVID. Um, would you mind elaborating a little bit more on, on the activities that you did do um, through the pandemic and into this year? Certainly, thanks for the opportunity to, to comment. Uh, starting a week after lockdown, uh, the Chamber started hosting weekly uh, Zoom calls with businesses in the Comox Valley. The first call, we had 96 people on the call. And we we decided, we knew that we our job was to be the resource. And so we started to 
search for business, help search for business grants, show people where they needed to go. Sometimes we referred them to one of our um, board members who's a treasurer and she was able to follow through more with them and, and point them in the right direction. And as things unfolded and as businesses became impacted in various ways, such as how to get your employees back to work, um, how, to, how to make your workplace safe, so we had um, Work BC on the call. Uh, every single call, we had an accountant and Work BC on the call. Every single call, we dealt with mental health. We talked around mental about mental health and how how important it was to look at the mental health of our employees and and how we were all being affected by the situation. Something that none of us could look you couldn't look at another community or another country and say, oh, this is what they did because we were all in it together. The entire world was in it together. Uh, yes, and as uh, Daniel referred to, we launched the Stay Strong campaign, uh, the Restart Comox Valley campaign. We took $3,000 just before Christmas and gave away $200 gift certificates every Friday leading up to Christmas to, to help just encourage some goodwill in for the businesses and also for people that, that may be struggling financially. And one fellow, he actually had gotten a job and didn't have any steel toed boots and won the $200 gift certificate from Searle Shoes. And that, that was just a great news story for us. You know, we felt, and we have continued to work with, and that's part of the collaboration that we've continued. We've always had a good relationship with the BIAs but it's even stronger now because we're working on each other's campaigns. We're, we're making sure that, our, that their, everyone's voice is being heard around the table. Great, Thank, thanks so much. Um, a second question, if I may, this one would be to staff. Um, you know, I see a lot of similarities with outcomes that, are, that the chamber is, is, has had with what I think we were hoping to have happen through the ERTF. Um, and I'm wondering what our relationship would be or could be as a, as a regional district with our staff and with this type of initiative. I don't know if, I know I'm kind of springing this on staff because you're hearing about this at the same time as we are, but um, can you think of uh, if, uh, what kind of resources we could put to, towards this right now? Madam Chair, uh, um... My response will be that to allow us to look into this with the chamber, because as, as you said, this is our first time to see it. And uh, we look forward to the opportunity to work, work with the chamber, given all that they've done and the capacity that they have and what they represent in terms of the business community. It is a little aggressive in terms of our ability maybe to fund as early as August. As you are aware, we are trying to wrap up the, uh, the agreement that we have with uh, the Economic Development Society at this time, and things are a little up in the air as to what our financial resources will be in this in this year. But we will definitely, if it is your desire for more information, look into this with Diane and come back to you with the report and options. Thank you. Thanks, Russ. And we're very flexible. Thank you. Director Moran, you're next. All right. Thank you, Chair. Thank you, Diane. That was a very um, positive optimistic presentation. Um, I'm sure you've been following along a little bit with this board and certainly this board is not, is not in complete agreement around everything to do with economic development. But I think something that, um, that we have been looking at is a little bit more of a community economic development sort of approach. And I noticed that you had nonprofits as stakeholders. Um, and I know that the chamber has um, been involved in in lots of work with nonprofits, um, and I guess some of the social um, factors that impact, such as housing and childcare. Um, and I guess the the other thing um, in terms of our strategic priorities, and this is not just with the RD, but also with City of Courtney for sure around climate change, etc. Some of the conversations have been around. Um, having our economic development really um, look at the values of our community and what kind of economic development are we interested in and want to support that aligns with those values. Um, so I guess what my question is, in terms of uh, stakeholders and that kind of approach, which might be a little bit different from a more traditional approach to economic development, if you have anything that you can share on how you would weave in some of those things that I just mentioned. Well, the, cha the chamber, thanks for your question. 
Wendy. The chamber is involved or we sit on the um, daycare uh, and child care committee. Um, we, we were there to listen. We're there to find ways that we can also support and come alongside. We also have a seat at the Homelessness Coalition. We, um, um, I'm, we'll, we uh, the chamber is on the OCPAC, so we've been very involved with that. We just held a local economy roundtable with uh, businesses in the Comox Valley because one of the areas that we felt might be missing a little bit is to have more voice for the business side of things under just under local economy. So um, I don't have a definitive idea of which way we're going to go with with this in terms of you know what will come out of that, and that's the whole point of bringing together the stakeholders and allowing everyone to have a voice at that table. I think that's that's the really important thing to me in our community is to is to build trust and to have true collaboration. Great, thank you. Next we have Director Cole Hamilton. Thank you, Chair, and thank you, Diane. This is, a, I think, a really interesting model and uh, obviously builds on your history of bringing business and other stakeholders together and particularly the recent history of doing that during COVID. I was um, just wanting to think a little bit about the financing of this. You, you'd um, think in your diagram, you'd illustrated that uh, sort of the funding might come from the CVRD, the chamber and other funders. Mm -hmm. And I was wondering with other funders, whether you were thinking more discrete grants, whether you had any eyes on any long-term partner type funders for um, something like this. Thank you for the question, Will. Um, we are currently looking at um, uh, working, you know, first of all, getting a person in house and what, what would we need to do around that? We just completed a community workforce response grant where we had 10 very talented youth. I think some of you heard them speak or they did community conversations. So there's a lot of grants that we'd be able to go after to spearhead this. And then as we move forward, we would you know, start to branch out a little bit more. One thing that um, the chamber prides itself in is it's easy for us to respond. You know, We're very quick at, um, we have some pretty um, dynamic uh, team members in here <laughs> and uh, we seem to be quite good at responding to, to needs as they occur. And uh, I don't want to use the word creative because that doesn't sound right, but no one that deals with accounting likes that word. But um, we do have some irons in the fire. And, um, and we, as Russ has mentioned, we're more than happy to sit down with the regional district and say, all right, what, what could you afford or what, what would it look like? Because um, we also believe that, that something shouldn't be born on the back of something else completely. You know, I think there has to be some give and take. Okay, thank you. And, and Chair, I have a short follow-up, is that all right? Go ahead. Great, thank you. I was just, it's obviously early days and I know there are gonna be follow-up discussions with staff, but I was just curious as to whether you had like a ballpark budget for this kind of collaboration. Would you think it would, just to give us something to think about initially? Yeah, we're kind of throwing out, um, perhaps asking for you know close to a hundred thousand dollars to get started and get get a team, get a staff person in place, get our get our the advertising and marketing done around pulling the collective together, and then be able to kind of bridge ourselves as we accumulate the rest of the funding that we're going after. That's that's off the. Why well, don't want to say off the top of my head because I have been looking at numbers, but. You know, it's not written in stone, but you always have to have somewhere to go to work from. And uh, and sometimes you need to say, okay, this is how much money I need. Okay, what am I going to do to get there? Fair enough. Well, it's it, um, interesting to get an initial glimpse, and I'm glad to you'll be you'll be following up with staff to just put some more flesh onto this. Thanks, Dan. Appreciate it. Thank you so much. Okay, I don't see any further questions or lights on. So thank you so much, Diane. Thank you. Thank you very much. I appreciate it. Have see a good you. evening. Thanks. And, and anyone opposed to receipt? Hearing and seeing them, that's carried. So we'll move on to our second delegation, which is 
in regards to human sex trafficking, sexual exploitation, and child sex trafficking in BC. And it'll be presented by Kathy Peters. Welcome, Kathy. Thank you very much. Human uh, sex. Yeah. Arbor and Grieve, first and second. Sorry, go ahead, Kathy. <laughs> Sorry, I didn't know when you wanted me to start. Yep, that's great. Thanks so much. Okay. Human sex trafficking and sexual exploitation for the purpose of prostitution is the fastest growing crime in the world and it is here. So what is human trafficking? It is a recruiting, transporting, transferring, receiving, holding, concealing, or harboring, um, harboring or exercising control over a per person for the purpose of exploiting them. The key word is exploitation. This is modern day slavery. Here are some stats. 13 years old is the average age of recruitment, much younger for Indigenous girls. In the lower mainland, the target age now is 10, 11, and 12 year old girls. It's shocking. COVID has made this much worse. Traffickers are very organized and sophisticated. 54% are Indigenous they are severely overrepresented in the sex industry. This is the worst case of systemic racism in the country. I shared this with the BC Indigenous Chiefs and Federal Minister of Justice David Lametti a couple of months ago. Indigenous women and girls at the very least want forensic nurses and rape kits. 82% involved in prostitution had childhood sexual abuse and incest which is preparation for prostitution later on. 72% live with complex PTSD, and this is the worst form of trauma a human being can experience. 95% in prostitution want to leave. It is not a choice. It is not a job. 86% have housing needs. Homelessness makes them vulnerable. 82% need drug rehabilitation because drugs and the sex industry go together. So I've been raising awareness about sexual exploitation and specifically child sexual exploitation and trafficking to every city council, MLA, MP and police agency in BC since the Protection of Communities and Exploited Persons Act PSEPA became federal law in 2014. So I've been raising awareness about this law so the police would enforce it, so the public would understand it and be able to report it. The law has three parts. Number one, it targets the demand by targeting the buyer of sex. The predator, trafficker, pimp, facilitator, John and, or buyer of sex are criminalized. Number two, recognizes that the seller of sex as a victim, usually female and is not criminalized. Number three, exit strategies are put in place to assist the victim out of the sex trade. We do number two and three all right in BC, but we don't do number one. So this law focuses on the source of harm, which is the buyers of sex and the profiteers. The clear statement from parliament was that girls and women in Canada are not for sale, that they are full human beings with dignity and human rights. Vancouver and Toronto are global sex tourism hotspots. Canada is known as a child sex tourism destination and the public are not aware of that. And I got that from the tip report, that's the trafficking in persons report from the US State Department. Council has, or sorry, the regional district has received my handouts. These handouts are a good place to start to address human sex trafficking, especially I really like that handout on how to prevent child sex trafficking. And again, here is the, uh, I'm holding up the book uh, by Dr. Robert Christmas called Sex Industry Slavery and protecting Canada's youth. My website also has very helpful information. It's the beamazingcampaign.org. The global sex, traf uh, global sex trade is growing fast. It is targeting our children because children is where the money is, fueled by the internet where most of the luring is taking place. Contributing factors to a rapidly growing sex industry is globalization, unregulated technology, no surprise, limited law enforcement, and very little prevention education. And that's the bit that I do. Canada has a new national human trafficking hotline number. And I did send a wallet card to the regional district uh, with help and resources. And provincially we have OC tip as a helpline. And also we have victim link in BC. Pornography is fueling the sex industry and creating the market for commercially paid sex. Men and boys are the buyers of sex and are the key to end exploitation. I just got this line from the Vancouver Police Department. They said this, our boys and men need to understand there's a sacred part of the woman 
they have no right to. So what can you do in the regional district? It's really simple strategy. You want to reduce the demand by targeting complicit businesses and you want to diminish the supply by education and public awareness. So you can train business licensing managers. And again, I know this is what you do in your actual communities. What to look for when granting business licenses. This is a really effective way to give the message to the sex industry. It is not welcome in any of your communities. So for example, number one is always unregistered massage and body rub parlors. Number two is nail spas. Number three, and they just rebrand different terms, holistic health centers day spas, modeling agencies, tattoo parlors, escort services, cheap bars and hotels, men's clubs, Airbnb, VRBO, casinos, strip clubs, organized crime clubhouses, and truck stops can be typical covers for sexual, for sex trafficking and exploitation. If there are crime clubhouses, you can use land use bylaws to remove them. They did that in Manitoba. Regarding hotels and motels in Ontario, which is best practices globally, actually, in an effort to curb trafficking, they mandate registration of every guest who's physically in the room, not just paying for the room. The sex industry is a targeting aggressively our youth, children, and vulnerable in every BC community. And schools are the recruiting grounds for gangs and sex trafficking. A critical deterrent are the school liaison officer programs in schools. Officers prevent crime and protect the vulnerable. Any anti-police narrative harms our communities. They are the only people trained to protect us. BC is getting further and further behind every province in Canada in both enforcing the federal law and raising awareness with prevention education. Therefore, BC and the Lower Mainland is the best place in Canada to buy and sell women and children for sex. Public awareness in BC is completely lacking. That's why I have sent information packages to all regional districts and city councils in BC to warn you all of this rapidly growing crime. Um, I do have a couple of questions, but I also did wanna show you because everybody asks me where I get my stats from. Um, stats Canada 2019 just came out, the numbers, are low, but the trend is up. RCMP, of course, National Human Trafficking Hotline number. Um, locally, I already mentioned in BC, what we've got is the Office to OCTIP and Victim Link. But also, Joy Smith is the expert in Canada, Valiant Ritchie. He's with the OSCE. He's the global expert. And I just was at a conference for the last four days where I got to hear these people present. So um, there's your trafficking in persons report. And again, sorry, trafficking in persons Sorry, Stats Canada, there you go. So I do have three asks. Number one, could I present to any stakeholders that are in your communities? Number two, could you please alert the Premier and Solicitor General that this crime is a priority in BC and we need funding for provincial law enforcement and we need a provincial awareness campaign. BC also needs an interagency human sex trafficking task force similar to what is available for drugs and gangs. That's found in Alberta, Manitoba, Ontario, Nova Scotia. And finally, could you write me a letter of support? Thank you very much. Thanks, Kathy, for bringing that all to our attention. Are you open to questions? Absolutely. Okay, first we have Director Arbor. Thanks so much for uh, shining a light on, on this really difficult issue. My, uh, I, I just went through your literature that you sent and my daughter is turned 12, not that long ago. And it seems to be just around the age where you're, you know, there's a lot of reports of children um, starting to be targeted. Um, that's shocking. And um, I, I'm in support of the letter of support. And second, I'm, uh, I'll have two questions. Uh, one is, has any of the regional districts or municipalities, or, or are you aware of any advocacy um, to the Union of BC municipalities through resolution or otherwise that, uh, that can give a broader voice to the, this problem from the perspective of municipalities to the province? Uh, 
Yep, that's an excellent question. UBCM in 2015 did pass two resolutions, one on human trafficking and one on rape culture. The one on human trafficking just kind of died. <laughs> Nothing happened. The one on rape culture did go to the FCM. So absolutely, I had a booth at the UBCM in 2019 at the Vancouver Convention Center when we were meeting in person. I just um, emailed UBCM and because it's virtual this year, I cannot do a workshop. I've had a lot of councillors and mayors suggest that I do a workshop because this is such a problem here in British Columbia. We are literally decades behind any other province in the country. So the sex buyers and the sex traffickers are very organized. They can act with impunity in our province. So it's a real concern. And I mean, your area is so charming and so delightful, but you're close to Nanaimo, which is a port city. You're close to Vancouver, you're close to Victoria. And these are global sex tourism destinations. So UBCM, absolutely, that is the direction I'd like to go. But I think because it's virtual, until we go in person, I don't think I have that access. Thank you, and uh, thanks for that information. I'll, I'll definitely review the resolutions. I can definitely commit to that uh, and try to trace that. And the second is, um, in terms of sexual abuse, uh, we often hear that often it's a family member that's, that's nearby and, and things like that. How does that link to the problematic around uh, child sex trafficking? Do, do you still find that there are strong family sources to uh, and connections to it? or? Or what, what are the trends around that? Yes, no, absolutely. Families typically, I mean, often will pimp out their own children. That is not uncommon. Um, as a matter of fact, we're seeing a growing number of that. Um, so it is a huge problem within families, yes. And so it's connected. Thank you. Next we have Director Hillian. Thank you, Chair, and uh, thanks very much uh, for your presentation, Kathy. Uh, I did meet you a few years ago when you presented to uh, Courtney Council, and uh, I have a background in uh, public safety and law enforcement, so uh, I'm certainly no stranger to the concerns that you raise. And uh, I just wanted to support uh, Director Arbor's comments uh, about uh, um, adding our voices uh, to uh, support for uh, addressing this issue. I do wonder whether uh, you take any uh, solace from uh, the high profile uh, um, uh, prosecutions that we're hearing about um, on the national stage uh, in the last uh, couple of years, uh, of very uh, powerful and wealthy individuals who've been exposed as uh, running major sex trafficking rings on an international scale. Uh, do you see any, uh, um, any benefit uh, from uh, the publicity that comes from those types of high profile arrests? Um, that's a, again, exceptional question. Yes, I mean, absolutely that helps. But the problem in Brit British Columbia is we have no public awareness. So I have probably by now presented to almost half of the civic governments in British Columbia in the last eight or nine weeks. And the, the general response, you are unusual, you know something about this and you've heard me present before, but generally people are shocked. I mean, in the past, a few years ago, they didn't even believe me that it happened in British Columbia. And I've even had difficulty with law enforcement because they're lying to me as Kathy, we don't have, nobody reports it. Well, it doesn't mean it's not happening. I mean, it's, it's a huge problem, but people are afraid to report. They can't report. Anybody that's been sex trafficked, they are threatened with their lives if they report. I mean, they're going to be dead. So um, I've sort of become a voice for the, the, the vulnerable, certainly, and the voiceless. It, with the Indigenous women and girls, I mentioned they are severely overrepresented. I said that percentage in Canada is about 54%, but in the urban centres, like in Vancouver, downtown east size, it's 80%. In Man Manitoba, it's 70%. I mean, it's absolutely shocking. And um, uh, we have a provincial government right now that really, I mean, this is, this is why I love presenting to boots on the ground civic government. You understand this issue because you live with it, but the provincial government is really turning a blind eye. Whoops, I think we just... Oh, generally. Go. Well, thanks for that. Um, I, I, I think it makes uh, good sense to link this to the huge uh, tragedy of uh, missing and murdered Indigenous women and girls. Uh, and I know that we have a national inquiry that, uh, and report that was completed, but uh, you know, as with all these things, we see significant delays in implementation. So I think that uh, 
it probably makes sense to advocate at the federal level as well to uh, increase the uh, both the policing and the support to communities to address these challenges. Thank you. Thanks. Next we have Director Hamir. Thanks, Chair. And thank you, Kathy, for your presentation. I, I think it's, um, we can obviously see the passion that you have brought to the topic and the fact that you have so many stats to back up um, your presentation um, specifically, uh, and I wanted to speak to the, the percentage of Indigenous women um, that you, you just quoted, 84% in the downtown east side and over 50% elsewhere. I think the one thing that just is not quite sitting well with me was your comment around um, the RCMP being the only body that should be dealing with this. Because um, A, I think it doesn't quite acknowledge the interaction that the RCMP has had, the historical bad faith that it has had with the Indigenous community, um, not to mention the, the issues that are currently happening around racism. Um, with women of color. So I just would want to comment on your presentation. It, that didn't sit well with me. Um, I think there are a number of other organizations in, in communities that can also work on this, on this um, topic. We have a, a fantastic tr transition society here who I would also love to bring into the conversation. And um, by kind of s signaling that the RCMP is the only one, I think, I'm not sure if that's what you meant in your presentation. Um, I am for increasing resources to civil society like transition society. So just maybe a comment on, on is, if that was actually what you meant. Okay, that again, excellent questions here. You're also thoughtful, this is wonderful. It's got to be to deal with human trafficking and this is according to the United Nations. So I'm talking, um, you know, for sort of globally, you've got to have enforcement and education. The two have to go together. If you do not have enforcement, uh, sex trafficking tends to take off. When you have the two together and any states that combine the two, they tend to put a damper on human sex trafficking. So I held up the name Valiant Ritchie. He's your global expert. You can look him up. You can just Google his name and he does presentations all the time. You have to deal with the demand. How do you deal with the demand? That's the buyer of sex. You have to criminally charge them. And until you have that turned in place, um, you, will never, um, you will never dampen the, the robustness of the sex industry. It's too lucrative. The, the money, it, it's so much money involved and you have to have a deterrent where you say to six buyers, you, you can't buy and you say to traffickers, you're gonna get caught, you're gonna get charged. If there's not that deterrent, um, human sex trafficking is just gonna take off. The sex tr uh, industry will, uh, will take off. So again, I, I'm gonna use a term called the Palermo Protocol. You can Google that. Canada has signed on to it. And one of its articles is very clear, and we've signed on to this, is that we do address demand. And you have to address the demand piece. If you don't, human sex trafficking is going to continue just to take off. I, I hope that makes some sense. Um, actually, not really, because I don't think the RCMP is in the business of, of, of education around demand. Um, it, it can obviously take a, a dampening effect on, on um, enforcement, I, I see that, but I think the education that has to happen in the community is outside the realm of the RCMP. So I won't, I won't belabor the point, but I just would like if you, you know, maybe rethink some of your wording around who should and shouldn't be involved in this um, and, and maybe widen your, your umbrella a bit. Okay, thank you. Next we have Director Grieve. Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, thank you, Kathy. This is uh, very depressing, just around dinner time to hear all this news, but we talk about it being demand driven. Uh, so much like uh, gambling and, uh, and drugs, prostitution is driven by, by individuals that uh, basically, uh, I don't know if you can actually uh, deal with it through the criminal justice system because it's an addiction like many other things. And notwithstanding um, the Indigenous community, Canada is set, as you probably know, to bring in 1.2 million uh, immigrants in the next two years. 
Um, this, of course, on top of the 1.6 temporary workers we already have in the country. So do you see this actually uh, exponentially increasing as the number of uh, women and, and uh, girls uh, with limited English skills hit the streets, much like we see in the States? Um, again, outstanding questions and comments. Um, they are going to be very, very vulnerable to sex trafficking. Absolutely. Um, new migrants, behind the Indigenous women and girls, it's the new migrants, um, to either be trafficked or to traffic, and it's simply because of the amount of money involved. Um, a victim will bring in $280,000 to $360,000 for a trafficker per year. And most of the, and organized crime is typically very involved with this. So if you've got Hells Angels, I mean, these organized crime groups are using sex trafficking um, as a fundraiser. And, and again, it's the amount of money, that is the problem. So I just wanna pack pot back to the law enforcement. It's just that they are, I guess I'm not explaining it properly, but they do act as a deterrent so that they know that they could get caught. Does that mean they end up in jail? The buyers end up in jail? No, not necessarily. There's all kinds of things that can, can be happen with that. But it's the point is the sex buyers need to know they could get caught. They're less likely to buy sex if they know they could get caught. Great. I don't see any further lights on or any hands raised. So thanks so much for doing a presentation for us today and all the presentations that you've been doing. It sounds like you've been very busy, but this definitely sounds like something that requires all of our attention. Thank you very much for your time. Thank you. And is there anyone opposed to receipt of the delegation? Hearing and seeing none, that is carried. And so we've already done uh, reports for Black Creek. So we move on to the Regional Poverty Assessment and Reduction Preliminary Findings. Uh, Hillian and Arbor, thank you. And I'll pass it over to staff. Thank you very much, Chair and Directors. And Alana Mullaly will introduce this report and the uh, consultants in attendance that will update you on this uh, um, project so far. Great, thank you very much, Russell. Through Chair Kettler to the directors, I'm here today to offer you an update for your information on the Regional Poverty Reduction Strategy Project. Momentarily, you'll be receiving a presentation from our consultants at Urban Matters, led by Aaron Welk. Um, Aaron will be presenting the findings of the public engagement undertaken so far, uh, engagement that was um, pursued via a community survey targeted one-on-one -on -one interviews with individuals and organizations who are involved in poverty reducing services and programs, group sharing circles with residents with lived or living experience of poverty in the Comox Valley, and a series of self-guided toolkit sessions. You'll recall that this work builds on previous work, including the housing needs assessments, childcare inventories, the myriad initiatives of nonprofit service providers, island health, face-based, faith-based organizations and citizen advocacy groups. This project is not about reinventing the wheel. Our key community partners in the work are the Coalition to End Homelessness, the Social Planning Society and the Community Health Network. Before I turn it over to Aaron to dig into the engagement findings, I would like to promote our next engagement session, which is a game changer workshop and registration has been sent to your CAOs, uh, scheduled for the afternoon of May the 20th. We've also sent invitations to key organizations and individuals to discuss next steps and plan for poverty reduction actions in the Valley. And with that, I'd like to welcome Aaron Welk to present our engagement findings. Thank you. Thanks, Alana. Good afternoon, everybody. Uh, it's great to be here today with you to present an update on the Regional Poverty Assessment and Reduction Strategy. I wanted to also introduce uh, my colleague, Dalen, who's here with me today. You'll be hearing from her a little bit later in our presentation. Next slide, please. So the objectives for this strategy are as follows. The first is to develop an understanding of the challenges and barriers faced by people experiencing poverty, and, uh, and then to assess and identify any gaps in the available services and supports in the communities um, and the region to address poverty. 
And so we know that the, the eventual strategy uh, that we are creating uh, is intended to pursue actions that relate to the focus areas that I'll outline in a moment. And the intent is to reduce poverty in the Comox Valley by 25% over the next four years. So you can see uh, a rough project timeline uh, along the bottom of your screen there. Uh, we completed the engagement report last month and we're happy to be presenting uh, some of the findings to you today. Uh, as Alana mentioned, there's a Game Changer workshop coming up on May 20th and we'll give you more information about what that entails. And then we have uh, quite, quite a quick turnaround time for the, the final draft strategy and report um, uh, in order to get to project completion by the end of June. Next slide, please. So the, the uh, poverty assessment and reduction focus areas uh, are adapted from the provinces together BC uh, strategy, um, which, is the, which is BC's poverty reduction strategy. And uh, these were carefully selected by the project team and our community partners. And so the, the strategy that we are working on developing will focus on each of these areas and recommend actions to improve outcomes and reduce poverty across the region. Uh, it should be noted, though, uh, that these uh, are areas of impact um, that elicit outcomes that are interconnected and contribute collectively to reducing poverty. Poverty, and we'll we'll share some examples of how that uh, sort of plays out uh, as we share some of the engagement findings today. Next slide, please. So the type of engagement that we conducted uh, that forms the informs the the work that we're sharing with you today. Uh, consist of a community survey uh, of which we had uh, just over 200 participants. We conducted 14 uh, in-depth interviews with various service providers in the community and uh, ran a series of sharing circles with people, uh, primarily uh, people with lived experience um, of, of different sorts of poverty in the region. And we also created a self-guided toolkit that different organizations uh, were able to kind of work through the series of questions in a collaborative way. So about 30 organizations and uh, almost 70 participants um, uh, uh, engaged with these toolkits. And as we mentioned, we have a, a game changer work workshop that's still upcoming. Next slide, please. So in order to, to really dive into the feedback here, uh, the feedback related to cost of living and housing, housing affordability really relates to the findings of the CVRD regional housing needs report that was completed in 2020 uh, that suggests you know, that it, there's a significant need for more housing that is affordable, in particular for those who are on a fixed income within the rental market, as well as housing that's accessible and connected to public transportation options. And that report uh, outlines, uh, you know, some key data pieces that inform our work as well. Um, for example, 10.3% uh, of households are in core housing need, and nearly 30% of renter households are in core housing need. And so this was reflected in the uh, feedback that we received from our engagement as well. Uh, the top two barriers highlighted by people um, in meeting their basic needs were first, the high cost of living, and second, house of housing affordability. Uh, in fact, uh, almost 60% of the survey response respondents um, had difficulty in accessing housing or housing supports, um, including those who uh, were in ownership, rental, transition, emergency shelter, and other housing categories. And as well, people experiencing poverty are, um, are therefore sort of uh, more likely to be living in unsafe and unhealthy housing uh, due to the lack of, of available options. And newer developments, uh, even as they come online, um, uh, participants shared with us that they're not necessarily affordable and uh, not necessarily oriented to meet family needs. And so what this means for people experiencing po poverty um, is that often individuals are needing to make significant trade-offs in their lives. So um, one of these trade-offs relates to healthy food. Uh, people are unable to afford uh, and access healthy and nutrition, nutritious foods consistently. Their transportation options are constrained. And often, um, you know, over 40% of people indicated uh, not having enough money to cover one-time unexpected costs, such as, you know, car repairs, dentists, or medical expenses. Next slide, please. 
With respect to income supports, uh, there were a number of challenges raised around the design uh, of income support programs, uh, as well as the lack of secure employment op opportunities. And, and both of these things uh, combine to keep people uh, living in a poverty cycle, unable to get out of that, uh, that cycle. Um, and so with respect to income assistance, uh, uh, the eligibility requirements are not comprehensive not comprehensive enough. I mean, many households, you know, who are you know, very slightly over the income threshold uh, are, are still vulnerable and um, often still living in poverty. And many of the income assistance benefits cease too soon. So uh, if, you, if you are, you know, let's say you get a raise or you get a different job and you do bump up over that uh, income threshold, um, it doesn't allow people to, you know, trying to transition out of poverty to build any sort of financial security. And, uh, you know, we also heard uh, that people experiencing poverty face barriers in accessing employment and other opportunities to enhance their standard of living. And so some key solutions uh, we heard uh, were around creating secure employment opportunities um, and supporting people gaining that employment um, so those measures, as well as uh, offering, um, you know, good living wages can help close the gaps in the cost of living um, and support people overcome those challenges associated with that, uh, that you know, uh, never ending poverty cycle. Next slide, please. One of the things that we heard with, with respect to services in the community was that uh, the service most, uh, most often um, highlighted by the survey respondents was uh, the need for mental health services. And um, uh, what, we, what we heard was that the high cost of living um, and housing pushes families into sort of more remote areas um, where they might become more isolated and cut off from services. You know, those constant trade-offs that I mentioned earlier over monthly budgets um, can lead to increased stress and anxiety. And, uh, you know, as well, a connecting point uh, is in, insufficient active and public transportation networks, you know, that prevent, bar uh, prevent families and other individuals uh, from accessing those, uh, you, know, you know, connection points, um, social connections, as well as other types of services. And children and youth in remote and rural areas lack access to, as uh, you know, some of those, those uh, things as well are even, even more so related to transportation or even in um, learning and growth opportunities. And this is really important because mental health services prevent uh, families, children and youth um, uh, from accessing those services and you know, supporting the next generation achieving their full, full potential, which is required as well to break that poverty cycle. Thank you, next slide, please. So with respect to uh, public transit, what we uh, heard from uh, people throughout our engagement was that uh, many people experiencing poverty are relying on public transit and active transportation, or they, uh, they're experiencing barriers uh, to meeting their other basic needs because they're sacrificing uh, to maintain um, uh, and drive a car. And so uh, with respect to transit, uh, we heard that women and other vulnerable people um, have, it, have expressed feeling unsafe uh, with respect to the local transit system, either you know, people who are approaching them um, or are feeling unsafe um, at night in isolated places. As well, uh, you know, we heard that the high dependence on driving uh, may have to do with the gaps in the local transportation system. So related to infrequent service, lack of connectivity between uh, various areas um, and uh, you know, limited service or limited uh, hours of operations. And uh, as well, what we heard from participants um, in, in the engagement was that uh, sidewalks and pathways present mobility barriers. So this can create risk and isolation for people in vulnerable circumstances, seniors, mothers with, with young, young children and others. Next slide, please. Uh, with respect to healthy food, uh, you know, a shocking 49% of survey respondents did not have access to nutritious food year round. And 82% um, had to choose between healthy foods or other household, household costs uh, most of the time. So there's that trade-off piece again 
uh, that people in poverty are experiencing on a on a, you know regular basis. And uh, access to the food banks or social serving organizations uh, delivering that food is really critical. So people without private transportation and working individuals reported having trouble accessing the food bank um, due to limited hours or due to uh, transportation constraints. Um, and about 46% of individuals indicated spending more than a quarter of their monthly income on food. Um, and even 7% spent more than half of their income on food. And interestingly, we heard, you know, a quote from a, a participant. Um, this was a service provider, I believe, uh, reporting on the, uh, the, the types of clients. Um, you know, in the past, clients were mainly those on fixed incomes, but increasingly now working people represent um, a greater and greater share of those needing help. Uh, and so uh, it's, it's, you know, and this person was indicating that uh, this is not a way, of, a way of life, but it's important to remember that um, many working people are, are accessing these types of supports as well. Next slide, please. And finally, related to childhood vulnerabilities, um, you know, in, in particular, what we heard uh, was connecting the dots uh, between um, childhood vulnerabilities um, and the, those links um, to, uh, you know, uh, experiences of poverty, housing challenges, and food insecurity. Um, and, uh, and what we heard around uh, the options for childcare in the community are really reflective of the findings of the Comox Valley Child Care Action Plan that was completed in 2019. And according to that study, on average, approximately four out of five families in the Comox Valley are unable to access licensed childcare. Uh, that includes group daycare, family care, and before and after school care. And so uh, in that study, uh, parents indicated that their top priorities were affordable childcare options, flexible hours, improved quality, and services for children who need extra supports. And, uh, and in particular, as it relates to people experiencing poverty, the lack of childcare impacts employment and higher education opportunities, especially for young mom mothers or single parents. And this, again, per can perpetuate the poverty cycle for individuals uh, looking, for, uh, looking for work or uh, looking to, uh, uh, to gain additional skills through, through education. And uh, just a few other things to note here that uh, we're hearing that women and families in rural areas are socially isolated and, and have limited connection to services. So again, that, that connectivity piece. And, uh, and uh, sort of a system coordination uh, sort of gap that we heard with respect to the school system uh, that, uh, that might be able to bring together programming for families. Um, so the school system really has uh, great access to families' resources and a desire to affect change, but there isn't a coordination uh, uh, between uh, either social serving organizations or others um, and the school system. And so with that, that I'll ask for, uh, the, for the next slide and I'll uh, pass it over to my colleague, Dalen. Thank you, Erin. Um, and thank you everyone for, for having um, us present this evening. Um, I only have a few slides to go over, but uh, in order to caption, capture the human experience and condition as it relates to the study, we put together a few personas to highlight some of the challenges experienced by those with lived or living experience. These examples that I'm sharing um, are based on people's feel, feed, feedback um, as part of our engagement process. So uh, on the screen here, um, I have Jane. Uh, this is Jane and her, her beautiful son. And, uh, and Jane's really happy. Um, she just landed two jobs over the past two weeks and feels very proud of her accomplishments. Um, she finally has a monthly income of $2,000. The next slide, please. However, um, despite Jane's recent success for her family and feelings of pride and accomplishment, she now doesn't qualify for income assistance, even though she is still low income. This uh, systemic challenge and this gray area of vulnerability, vulnerability will ultimately impact her ability to access opportunities and enhance her lifestyle for both her and her family. Next slide, please. 
And this is Amy. Um, Amy's, uh, Amy's, Amy's very concerned with the experience that many non-binary children and youth face within the Comox Valley. Often, uh, two SLGBTQIA plus youth are being kicked out of their homes upon declaring their gender identity. And currently, there are no queer youth services to provide support for these displaced kids and youth. Next slide, please. This social exclusion and gap in services could lead to homelessness or housing insecurity. The next slide. I know those person personas, um, you know, are just there to, to share a bit of the, the human experience of poverty within the region. Um, but but our next steps within this project are to look to try to address some of the challenges um, faced, faced regionally. And so what's next for us, as both um, Alana and, and, Alar and Aaron have alluded to, is a Game Changers workshop. So on May 20th, uh, the CVRD of Partners will be hosting a virtual Game Changers workshop. The Game Changer method is based on the Tamarack Institute's Institute's approach to poverty reduction. And a game changer is a poverty focus area that not only aims to deliver on its own specific goals, but also elicits an array of other significant pos positive outcomes that ca cascade both within and outside of its area of emphasis. So when we gather on May 20th, we will aim to achieve the following obje objectives listed on the screen. In addition to identifying specific actions, to achieve the overall plan's objective of reducing poverty in the CVRD by 25% over the next four years. And so we've invited um, representatives from community, local government, including elected officials, representatives from Comox First Nation, and a few attendees with living or lived experience as well. And so following this workshop that will be happening next week, we'll work to summarize the process and integrate all of what we have found into the draft poverty assessment and reduction strategy. And uh, with that, that, that includes our presentation for, concludes our presentation for this evening. So thank you. Great, thanks so much. And you're open to questions? Of course, yes. So again, we have Director Arbor. Thanks, a lot of great work and it's funny, this is one of the days that makes me think maybe we should do local government a little bit differently on, on days like today where wouldn't it be great if we had our two MLAs sitting with us in this room listening to these presentations because, you know, around the human trafficking earlier, around these issues around poverty, a, a lot of the, um, our role as local official becomes to be advocates, but I, I want to make sure that I would love to see our, our MLAs actually attend these presentations so that they get such detailed perspective around what is happening in their writing. And, uh, and I don't know if there's a way for you guys to take it to them as well. In, in, in some of the pieces that do belong to local government, and I'm so glad you did the slides, the stories at the end, because at first my comment was going to be how much I appreciated some of the impact stories shared on page 53. I, I thought they were really resonant, but then you did that with the uh, presentation, so that was great. Um, but in terms of our wheelhouse, um, you know, there's some good stories. Like I I knew when we invested in, in the Union Bay and the Denman Child Care, along with the province, that this this issue was cross-cutting and, and, and this sort of confirms it today in regards to that one, but there's others that I think that are in our wheelhouse that we can impact. So when you talk about obviously the um, safety of our buses, this is our system. So, you know, I think we need to di direct our staff to make sure that both on the, so cause I've ridden the bus quite a bit and I, I've had that experience of, of discomfort. Um, and I can see how for some people that discomfort can actually feel threatening. Uh, and sometimes there is, there can be uh, threatening um, whether real, uh, real and perceived. But I think that's something we need to look at. And, and in some of the rural areas, when you talk about getting dropped off and it's dark, all these different things, you know, 
talk about it? Do we need bollards? Do we need what kind of strategies can we do to ensure that uh, our bus system is safe? Um, there's just 1,000 things we have in there. I've just listed a couple. Um, but, uh, but again, it's, I'm thinking for some of the bigger ones, when you talk about living wage around dental that RMP is advocating for, um, all these different things, many of them are, feel like they're a little bit outside our wheelhouse, but uh, I really look forward to the next steps and, and hear more from, uh, from both you and staff. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks, we have Director Hillian. <laughs> Thank you, Chair, and uh, thanks, Erin and uh, Dalen, for the presentation. Um, yeah, tough, uh, tough issue. This isn't exactly an uplifting uh, uh, meeting I'm finding today, but uh, the reality is that uh, many in our community struggle with poverty, and I remember being struck a number of years ago when uh, the study was done on uh, early learning uh, for children in our area, and... Um, it was established that we had a fairly high rate of uh, children who were challenged with uh, early learning uh, disadvantages, uh, primarily because of, uh, of poverty. Um, you also brought back to me uh, one of the uh, the moms that I uh, that I always remember when I worked in human services, uh, who'd had her child in care for a period of time. And uh, you know that her child was then returned to her, and she always she talked about how impossible it was to actually provide for him as well as he was provided for while he was in care. And uh, it always struck me as ironic that we were prepared to pay people more to look after other people's children than to look after their own. Um, so these are obviously large uh, systemic challenges that we have. Um, I do look forward to the workshop coming up, but I wanted to ask you um, um, whether you, you, you see this area having uh, unique challenges that you reported uh, in this uh, presentation, or are we basically a reflection of what's going on in most communities in the province? Part of the reason I ask is because uh, we don't necessarily have major industry here. Uh, but it's a nice place to live. And I often wondered whether you know, when people are disadvantaged, they settle somewhere that's nice to live rather than somewhere where it's cold and miserable. Um, and, but I'm just interested to know, uh, you know, whether places uh, like Campbell River and Terrace and Kitimat and Prince George are dealing with the same issues, um, just how widespread this is or how unique the things that you're reporting to us are. Thank you. Yes, of course. Thanks for your comments and for your question. Um, so it's uh, it's a bit of yes and no with respect to your question around uh, how unique uh, the, the Comox Valley is. Um, we recognize that these issues exist across the country. Uh, in particular, uh, you know, in British Columbia, we recognize that uh, things related to housing affordability and cost of living are um, are significant for many communities. Uh, I think because the Comox Valley um, and region is such a sought after place to, li place to live, um, we are uh, hearing you know, slightly more individuals talking about that cost of living, but I wouldn't say that it's uh, remarkably different uh, than other communities. A couple of things that, that we, we would highlight as being uh, particularly unique in your context uh, relate to uh, the accessibility challenges. Uh, within your region um, around uh, having uh, many communities uh, that are spread out um, and services that don't exist in all of those different regions or, or different parts of the regions. And so you have a, you know, I would say a more unique transportation challenge than in other communities uh, with respect to accessing services and accessing um, uh, some of those supports um, and, and the resulting sort of isolation and, uh, and social challenges related to social connectivity. Um, that exist. Uh, we're not hearing those uh, as many as much about those types of things in other uh, jurisdictions where you know things might be um, that much more compact. Um, and the resulting sort of requirements to rely on um, and you know and sacrifice other things uh, to be able to maintain um, and uh, and keep repaired, uh, keep a car repaired, for example, uh, you know are some of the unique challenges compared to you know, other communities where um, you know a one one um, 
uh, there's sort of more direct bus services into a more central area where all of the services are located. And you touched upon uh, one other uh, thing that uh, I think maybe a bit more unique uh, that we were hearing from both lived experience which relates to employment um, and many people, even skilled individuals who are struggling to access employment in their fields. So uh, individuals that had that were um, in trades and, and other uh, types of industries were struggling to access some of those uh, uh, secure employment opportunities. And in particular, you know, employment opportunities that relates to uh, sort of uh, that would provide sort of some of those living wages uh, to be able to afford to work in your region. So hopefully that helps a little bit. Thank you. Um, next, we'll have Director Morin. Great, thank you, Chair. And thank you so much for the presentation. Um, having worked in human services as well as Director Hilling for many years, uh, sadly, not a lot of this surprises me, particularly around the, the piece that you just touched on around accessibility and isolation and transportation issues. I know, um, you know we've done a lot of work, I think, with our, our transportation system to, uh, to try to you know, make schedules that are better, et cetera. But we still have so many folks in the rural areas, um, you know, they can't, they often get offered a job and they can't actually keep it because they, you know, the bus doesn't run at whatever time to get them out, you know, in those more rural areas. And then the safety issue uh, from working with youth, it was a constant um, concern for young women in particular who would get dropped off at a rural bus stop, but then would have to walk for, you know, 20 minutes or half an hour to get to their house on a, on a dark rural road. So I think, you know, those are things that many of us maybe don't think about. Um, the other piece around the, the land use policies and the um, having services accessible, I thought it was interesting a few years ago when Thrifties was moving from their downtown location to uh, well, it's still downtown, but a few blocks um, south of that. And many people were in an uproar because they were losing their community grocery store right in the downtown core. But I found it interesting that many of them were my friends who actually had good jobs. And, and it was kind of a perk to go down to Thrifties and get all your fancy ingredients for your little gourmet meal. And I said, well, actually, there's lots of people who are happy who live in uh, the lower income apartments and housing um, closer to 17th, who were happy that they don't have to walk with three bags of groceries in the pouring rain as far. So I think, you know, those are things that, that it's important for us to be cognizant of um, when we are looking at um, services and um, developments and all those things. And um, I, I, yeah, I am looking forward to the next piece of this. And I, I really am appreciative of the, the human stories that you've brought to this and, and really um, fleshing that out for the report, I think is uh, those, those human stories and experiences are really important. So thank you. Thank you. Next we have Director Grieve. Well, first of all, thank you, Aaron and Dalen for this. Um, one of your stories there kind of uh, touched the memory with me back in my 20s. I had, I was a single father with a three-year-old son making a whopping five fifty an hour at the local hardware store. And uh, the boss gave me a 50 cent raise. And I thought it was great. And only found out later that uh, I lost $200 on my daycare subsidy. So I had to go back and ask my boss to take the money back. So um, interesting enough, um, I was, I attended uh, uh, the so Comox Valley Social Planning AGM on May 8th, and we heard a, a presentation from Susan Abels um, about guaranteed income, basic income, universal income. And you touched on that uh, on page 39 on universal basic income. And what was interesting was that, uh, that uh, and, and no offense to my uh, colleagues who have worked in the, um, in, in the local government uh, uh, social services. But uh, even a government as supposedly woke as the one we have in Victoria uh, commissioned a study on this and they commissioned it with a, a, a consultant that was well known to be opposed to it. And of course he did not disappoint and brought forward a, a, a paper. And uh, it was uh, thought that um, 
you know, that it was that, uh, you know, this would probably lead to, uh, to, to problems if, because uh, the poor can't manage their money. Uh, they'll blow it on booze, drugs, and pizza. Um, it, they, they need social services to be the gatekeepers and control it. And uh, they'll give out the money more carefully. And of course, uh, it's not backed up by any real research. Um, so here we have uh, uh, a framework that uh, just defends the BC social system and maintains the status quo with armies of, uh, of gatekeepers out there, all with their desks and their pensions. And uh, you can see in other countries where they actually have explored this and uh, it's, it's turned out to not be the, the terrible boogeyman that uh, this consultant made, out, made it out to be. That uh, people tend to, I mean, obviously there's always those with, uh, with issues that may need to, uh, to return to uh, caseworkers and whatnot. But uh, just, just to, to explore it, it was turned down basically because the alternative would be to dismantle a system that's been in place for a long time and disrupt a lot of employment. So I wonder if you have any comment on that. Uh, there we go. It's a great point. Uh, thanks for those uh, those comments. Yeah, I mean, the universal basic income uh, debate uh, is certainly uh, one that is alive in our country. And, uh, you know, many other jurisdictions, like you mentioned, are, uh, are showing really great uh, opportunities uh, for something like this. Uh, you know, this... Um, is an issue that uh, we anticipate may come may come up uh, next week during the Game Changers uh, workshop or something related to universal basic income um, as an as a game changing opportunity uh, for uh, for individuals experiencing poverty. Um, and if that was the case, I think the uh, you know the the viable action may be uh, for a, sort of an advocacy position uh, for the the regional district and associated local governments to take regarding. Uh, universal basic income, or, uh, you know, there may be ideas around uh, sort of a localized or regional uh, approach to this type of uh, this type of approach. But, um, you know, I think uh, it's something that's certainly, uh, certainly on the table uh, for discussion next week. Absolutely. Thank you. Next, we have Director Premier. Thanks, Chair, and, and again, thank you for the presentation. Um, you know, as, as local government, I, I think we we're constantly, or I know I am, trying to figure out how we can fix, you know, and, and really provide solutions to some of these really big, I guess you could say gnarly problems that are so multifaceted. Um, one thing I, I, I think that might bring a, a ray of hope, because I'm hearing a bit of depression around the table, is um, uh, both Director Grieve and I participate in the Comox Valley Childhood, or the um, Child Care Collaborative, and they are looking at some very innovative models of bringing um, you know, some programs into the rural areas, um, be it at um, unconventional sites or um, with a, a mobile um, you know, van that picks up uh, rural families and brings them to a, a central location. So I'm, I hope that we, they have a chance to present to this board and, and we can have a look and see um, what they're doing because I think it speaks to many of the issues that um, are brought up here around the isolation of young families in rural areas. Um, I was also really heartened to see some of the ideas and, and options for where there could be potential action um, from the regional district. And, and I hope um, in future we, we get to get into the, some of the meat of more of them, particularly intrigued about growing more food on the exhibition grounds. Um, but I, was, I just wanted to point out one item that um, I thought this might require some action a little bit sooner than later, because I noticed on page, I guess it's 19 of, of 83, that um, some of the, the discriminations that the LGBTQ community face around housing, food bank, and social support services due to some conservative, I guess, um, attitudes. And I know we as a, a regional district um, have been providing quite a lot of bit of funding through the COVID recovery and um, to our social service and our partners in the community. And I wasn't sure 
if we had asked if um, any of these agencies um, did discriminate against the, this community, if this is something that we didn't even, it was maybe something that we weren't aware of. And I don't know if staff could um, just have a look and see if, uh, and I know it kind of went through the community foundation. So there's, we're a little bit sec, a little bit removed, but possibly something we can look into is when we do provide funding in the community that we ensure that those who are receiving the funding um, provide barrier free uh, opportunities to our community so that people aren't facing um, the lack of access to those supports. So I don't know if, if staff wanted to comment or just I'll, I can leave it there for us to to think about. Alana, do you have a comment? Thanks. Through Chair, pardon me, through Chair Kettler to the directors. Um, I think that the points that you're raising really speak to equity, and that is one of the areas where this board certainly is to decision makers. You have a lot of influence and impact. So looking at all of the decisions that are made around this table through an equity lens, and sometimes the, the, the question might come to you in a very specific manner, such as you've, you've raised, Director Hanier. So I think that that is a role that we can play. Um, I think one of the important pieces about this work is that it's a beginning for us to start to think about applying a poverty reduction lens and an equity lens to the work that we do. So there is some really exciting work coming out of the city of Vancouver with the establishment of their equity office, tackling this very specifically, like how do we get our own house in order to ensure that we are making an impact in the lives of people and um, on, on so very many fronts, poverty reduction, social inclusion, and, and really becoming the kind of community that we, we are aspiring to this, through this work. So I think that's a really important area for us to, to start getting busy on. Thanks for those comments. And finally, we have Director McCollum. Thank you, Chair, and, and thank you, um, Dalen and Aaron, for the presentation and this report. Um, it was definitely full of um, useful information for me. I, it's a, a topic that I considered myself probably more well-versed on than perhaps the average um, you know, middle-class person in our community. And um, yet there was a lot in there for me to take in. So um, yeah, I appreciated that. I also really uh, liked um, the way that the gaps in the report were um, provided and just some context and, and the stakeholder interviews. I thought that was all great information. Um, one thing that I did kind of struggle with in reading like the, uh, the collated data with um, regards to the survey that looked like generally um, most of the survey questions had about 200 um, people that participated and, and looking through it, it, it appears that about 20% or maybe 40 of the um, participants identified themselves as struggling with poverty in some way, whether it was um, the question about not meeting basic needs or, or simply identifying that they are struggling with poverty. And then the questions go on to um, ask about how their transportation needs or daycare needs are being met. But um, it was the, the questions, of course, include all the respondents. But what I'm really interested in is that 20%, those 40 respondents that um, identified as having those challenges. And, you know, there's a daycare question um, where, you know, a lot of it's non applicable, and 70% of the people that responded don't have um, children in their home. So I'm wondering if there is like a way to kind of break out um, or, or if the data was collected in that way where we can really see, you know, I think 73% uh, of people said they drive. Well, I'm much more interested in those 25% that don't and what their specific challenges are around transportation rather than recognizing that of course, probably some of that 70% uh, that do drive also have um, perhaps some some issues around poverty, but um, you know I'm not as interested in someone that drives a car every day. What where they perceive gaps in our transportation, and I'm wondering if if there's any way um, to pull that um, those kind of specifics from from the way that the survey was conducted. Sorry if that um, was family. <laughs> No, thank you. Thank you for your question. I think that's a, um, a great observations. Um, and yes, absolutely. We can, um, we can uh, like for to inform our final uh, report and our draft report, we can uh, parse out the data 
um, so that we can take a look at um, it from a specific lens as you're suggesting. Um, recognizing that sometimes when that happens, your sample size does get quite a bit smaller. So, um, you know, not as great generalizations could be made, but there are still key takeaways in that. And so, yeah, I think, thank you for your comment. And um, that's something that, that, we, that we would like to do as well. Just a quick follow-up too, was, was the sample size um, what you were hoping or was that considered a, a reasonable um, result? I mean, I recognize this last year has been difficult in terms of engagement and, and whether or not it, either of you have any comments on, on how that part of, part of the study went. I'm happy with the, with the sample size that, that we received as part of the study. Yeah. Great, thank you. Thank you. Okay, I don't see any further hands. I, I did wanna thank all the participants in the surveys and the interviews. Um, as you heard, it does make quite an impact um, on directors to uh, hear those personal stories. I think we all understand that there's barriers out there, but when you um, see those specific quotes and um, understand you know, the daily challenges for people, um, it, it makes a difference and I think it, it does make for better policy and hopefully um, better provision of service eventually. So yeah, I just wanted to thank those people who did participate and encourage uh, participation in the May 20th um, Game Changer Workshop. And I'll say thank you to Aaron and Daylin and to Elena. And is there anyone opposed to receipt? Hearing and seeing them, that's carried. Thanks very much. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, before we go in camera, um, we had a little bit of uh, a spoiler uh, in Diane Hawkins' presentation, but uh, our CIO would like to uh, make an announcement. Oh, I'm sorry. Um, I was going to introduce uh, Lisa Kilpatrick, who is now no longer on the Zoom, unfortunately. But I can indicate to you that uh, Lisa Kilpatrick is our um, Economic Recovery and Community Resilience Coordinator that is now hired by the Regional District. So she was on the call to listen to the presentation. And uh, she comes to us from Nelson, and uh, where she worked for the Columbia Basin Trust, as well as Community Futures. And uh, her role is very specific between now and, and December, uh, in which she will help be helping the regional district in terms of its responsibilities in the economic development function. That includes uh, picking up the pieces of the economic recovery task force to bring to the, uh, the leaders uh, the results of what actions were taken and enable them to report out to the various sectors of the community what actions have been done. She will also uh, help support us in the uh, termination of the CVEDS contract and picking up any of the pieces of what we need to do uh, to support the service review and uh, actions taken this year. If uh, time permits or resources permit, she may be able to action some of the priorities that the board had from its strategic planning on economic initiatives. After this year, it's, uh, it's up in the air, or hers is a two-year contract, and uh, she will be supporting the services that require um, the service from her that may be economic development related if the board chooses through its service review to still do some work. Otherwise, there is other work associated with uh, other regional growth strategy with community services, the support of our grants programs or otherwise that will be her focus depending on the board's work plan adopted next year. So very flexible. So thank you for that. And then uh, one other question I have under new business, Madam Chair, is, is there any reports or follow up that the board wants from staff in regard to either one of the delegations? I'll put that out to the board. Director Arbor. Doesn't happen that often that staff asks for <laughs> further action. That's good. Um, I. Um, in regards to the uh, human trafficking, I think it, it'd be great to um, have this correspondence because she asked for a letter of support, but it was unclear to me where that letter of support would go or, or what the intent was. Um, and even if we can pull the UBCM resolution uh, for our ease from 2015 that she mentioned, so, so we have that understanding. And um, 
So did you want a motion or is this a requested action? Yeah, if, if you would like a mo to direct staff to bring back um, sure. suggestions with respect to letter of support or otherwise, that's something that we can do at the direction of the board. So, um, so. There were three um, requests from the um, from Kathy Peters that, that was uh, if there was any additional stakeholders that um, the board knew of. Um, the um, advocacy with the province and the, for the creation of an agency um, and uh, letter of support. Yeah. So. So I'll move that staff uh, brings back a report to consider those three requests. I'll second it. Okay, moved by Arbor, seconded by Grieve. Any further discussion? Uh, Director Morin. Thank you, Chair. Just to just to get some clarity. Uh, so, is the motion to look into the request and because I'm not really clear what what she was asking for. So is the report, is is that what you're, is the motion just to get more clarity on what she's asking for? Because I don't feel like I can vote on those actions today because I don't have enough information. That's what I understood the, the uh, resolution to be, is for us to come back with those items that she asked for, for your consideration. As a subsequent Great, meeting. thank you. Okay, any further discussion? It's a vote of the full board. Anyone opposed? Hearing and seeing none, that's carried. And uh, Director Hamir. Oh, sorry, it's Director Hillian. Thanks, Chair. I'm just wondering if, um, if it would be appropriate to have a motion uh, requesting staff to follow up with the chamber on their presentation. I'll second that. That's why I raised my hand. Okay. Motion by Director Hillian and seconded by Cole Hamilton. Any further discussion? Okay, and is there anyone opposed? Hearing and seeing none, that's carried. And our staff satisfied with that? Okay. All right, I think we can now move in camera. Thank you, everyone. Can we take five, Chair?